We've looked at what happens with um, the force that exists between two solid objects that are moving past each other. Uh, we're now going to look at what happens when we have a solid object moving through a fluid. Um, and just briefly, a fluid is um, something that flows, so basically a liquid or a gas. Um, so a solid object moving through either a liquid or a gas is what we're really dealing with here. Um, to tie back into what we've already seen, uh, with projectile motion uh, from unit uh, subtopic 2.2, we treated air resistance as being negligible. Now air resistance can be considered a type of fluid resistance, the air being uh, a gas. Um, and we treated air resistance as being negligible there just to simplify the analysis of motion uh, of an object as it's um, accelerating only due to the force of uh, gravity acting on it. Um, in reality though, um, air resistance does actually have an impact. Um, when any object uh, moves through um, a fluid, it is going to experience some resistance. And the reason for that is that um, the object um, stirs up the fluid. Um, and by stirs up, we kind of mean that the, um, if you think about a boat moving through water, um, it um, disturbs the water around it and as a result um, sort of creates a bit of turbulence and as a result um, that stirring up of the fluid um, causes a, uh, a drag force. So the, the fluid itself kind of pulls back on the, uh, the object as it's moving through the fluid. Um, So that's really what we're talking about when we're looking at fluid resistance. And to, if we were to look at this mathematically, um, it's actually a very complex relationship. There's a quite a few factors uh, that come into play. Um, so we'll only deal with um, so some basic ideas here. Um, rather than actually going into the, the mathematical equation. Um, so you only really need to be able to state the effects of fluid resistance here, um, not the mathematical relationship. And a couple of things that we'll look at here, and we'll look at um, the situation, it's probably the easiest one to consider when you're dealing with um, uh, fluid resistance, it's something like skydiving. Uh, it's one of the most obvious, uh, where you've got a person moving through air. Um, as we go through and look at skydiving, what I'm going to do is um, just draw some free body diagrams and then sort of annotate what the, um, the forces are and what's happening at that point in time. So we'll have a few different phases. I'll try to fit them all across the screen. Um, the first one would be jumping out of the plane. Um, and in that case, uh, keeping in mind that we have the, um, in a free body diagram, we just represent the forces acting on the object. So that dot there represents the center of mass of the uh, skydiver. Um, and I'll go through and label these. I'll, I'll um, uh, write the, the label out in full to begin with, uh, but then I'll just abbreviate it as we go. So initially we have the weight of the skydiver pulling down on the skydiver, um, and at that stage that's the only force. So um, as they jump out of the plane, there's zero vertical velocity, and as a result, um, no drag, or no drag force. Um, so that initial moment as they jump out of the plane, drag force, vertically at least, um, isn't um, anything you need to worry about because there's no uh, velocity. So there's the first phase. The second phase is then uh, during accelerated motion. And what we mean by that is that once they've jumped out of the plane, they're going to start to accelerate towards the ground due to their weight force. 
So we have the weight force still pulling down with the same magnitude, and the weight force will always be the same magnitude. Uh, so I'll just abbreviate that, abbreviate that to weight. Uh, but as they start to speed up, that drag force is going to now start to oppose their motion. Um, and so what we see there is that the drag force increases as the velocity increases. So that, um, like I said, the, or more specifically, let's go um, as the speed. So the, the, if we're dealing with velocity, it's always downwards, but we'll just talk about speed here. Um, the relationship here is a direct square, so the, the drag force increases with the square of the speed. Um, but just as a, a little side note there to fill in that detail. Uh, so basically there, the faster the, the fall, or the faster the speed of the, the skydiver, the greater the drag force is. So that's the second phase. The third phase is then at terminal speed. And at terminal speed, as the skydiver is falling, the, the weight force still being the same size, um, that drag force will continue to increase until the drag uh, balances the weight. Um, so we eventually reach a stage where drag force balances weight or drag force is um, equal and opposite to the weight. And what we know about that sort of situation is that if we have forces that are equal and opposite, um, there's no more uh, increase in velocity, there's no acceleration. So we're basically dealing with Newton's first law now. Um, so the skydiver will have a constant velocity. and that constant velocity or constant speed um, is known as terminal speed. Known as terminal because it doesn't increase any higher than that. There's nothing greater that you can achieve or no greater speed that you can achieve when you're falling unless of course you have, um, I don't know, something pushing you down. So if you had a jet pack or something that um, increased your downwards force. Um, the next phase then is when the parachute opens And the issue with the parachute opening is that the, there's a large increase in surface area. And that increase in surface area has an impact on the drag force and it causes it to be larger. So the large surface area of the, um, of the parachute increases the drag force. And as a result, we now have an unbalanced force. And that causes uh, a deceleration. So the, the vertical velocity will now uh, decrease because of the unbalanced force being applied to the skydiver. You can see that the drag force is now larger than the weight force. Um, Following that, the last phase of the fall that we're interested in, or the skydive, um, is at a second terminal speed, um, in this case with the chute open. And it now looks no different to the previous case um, where we had a terminal velocity while he was falling. The weight force is still acting down and now the drag force is uh, balancing that weight force again. The difference though is that we've had this period of deceleration. So once the descent has slowed again, uh, a second terminal velocity will be reached. Um, so the skydiver once again falls at a um, terminal velocity Uh, and that's 
due to the fact that um, the parachute is um, has slowed the, the the descent and therefore the drag force once again has um, decreased from a maximum down to uh, balance the weight and so the speed will now be lower. Um, I'm going to leave you with one last scenario to think about. Um, we'll discuss this one in class in more detail. The question I'm going to pose is um, how does air resistance affect the maximum speed of a car. So considering all of the forces that act on the car, um, what effect does air resistance have in that scenario? Um, like I said, we'll discuss that more in class and, uh, and go through that scenario in a similar way to what we've just done there with the, um, the skydiver as well.